We've reached a critical point in the schedule. Jets play the Giants on Sunday. We'll talk about what they need to do to win today on Locked On Jets. You are Locked On Jets. Your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome. This is the Lockdown Jets podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Friday, October 27th, 2023, and I'm your host, John B. from GangreenNation.com. Thanking you so much for making the show your first listen or first watch every day. Subscribe to the show for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you'll get new episodes as soon as they're posted. If you enjoy the show and are listening on a podcast source, please give it a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube and enjoy the show, give this episode a big thumbs up. These things help us out and help other Jets fans find the show. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code all lowercase locked on NFL for a first deposit match of up to $100. Well, the Jets play the Giants this weekend. It is the Battle of New York week, week eight action in the NFL. Jets coming off their bye, a big game for the Jets, and we're going to preview it on today's episode. And the Jets have now reached the second phase of their schedule this year. I think it's easy to break the schedule into phases, uh, and they're not always broken down evenly. I felt like heading into the season, the first six weeks were going to be really important for the Jets from the standpoint that it felt like the schedule was going to be really tough. And sometimes in the NFL, you're in your early projections for who's going to be good and who's going to be bad are not correct. Sometimes you say that early part of the season is going to be really tough and it ends up not being so tough. Sometimes, you know, you run into a team that gets off to a slow start. Sometimes you run into a team that you expect to be good, but is dealing with some serious injuries to key players. I think we can say that the first six weeks were as tough as advertised for the New York Jets. It looked like there were going to be four really tough games in the early part of the season, the Buffalo game, the game against Dallas, Kansas City, and then Philadelphia. Now, the one benefit the Jets had was that three of those four games were at home. And it was really not about jumping off to a four and two, five and one start. It was just about surviving. Because when you get off to a one and five kind of start, when you get it off to an 0 and six kind of start, that's when things can really start to snowball in this league. That's when you can develop issues in your locker room. You know, maybe get into a situation where players start doubt, doubting the coaching staff. You know, maybe they're not quite working as hard in practice. Maybe, you know, guys who are injured. Yeah, they aren't exactly rushing to get back. You see that happen all the time in the NFL when teams get off to bad starts. It just creates a lot of bad vibes around your team. And, you know, it can really derail the season before it gets started. And then when you get to the easier part of the schedule, you know, the season's already finished. Fortunately, the Jets have avoided that. And that was really what it was all about. It was about three and three. I, I, I said it I said it a lot during the summer, even when Rodgers was anticipated to be the starting quarterback, that I would have signed up for two and four through the first six weeks. And the Jets got to that. They actually started two and three. And I remember heading into the Philadelphia game two weeks ago. I was saying, you know what? I don't think the Jets are going to win this game. I'd sign up for two and four. I'd still take two and four the way that they were playing. You know, I felt like we saw enough there to make me believe that the team could win games after the schedule softened up. So it was, you know, it wasn't about winning every single week. It was about maybe establishing a certain level of play. It was just winning, winning enough games to stay in the playoff race, to not get too far behind the rest of the AFC. And the Jets accomplished that. I think that the expectations are higher for the next three weeks because you've got the Giants this weekend who are coming off a win. I don't think they're as bad as their two and five record would, su would suggest, but still, I would say that, you know, there are games you go into it saying the Jets could win this game. I think that the Giants are a team the Jets should beat. And I think if you are a team that has designs on making noise in the AFC this season, the next three weeks are critical. You've got the Giants, you've got the Chargers, you've got the Raiders. There are no easy games. There are no slam dunk wins in this portion of the schedule. I don't think there's a such thing as a slam dunk win in the NFL. I mean, maybe there's some really, really bad teams at the bottom of the league. But even then, you know, any given Sunday, you know, it's very hard to go through an entire season winless. So that means even the worst teams in the NFL are going to have their day where they play really well. There's no such thing as a slam dunk kind of win in the NFL. But if you're a team that has designs on making noise, on, on being a playoff team this year, this is a real opportunity. And we all know that you want to be playing well as the season gets into November and December. We know that you want to be playing your best football at the end of the season. That's absolutely true. But wins that happen now 
count just as much as wins that happened in November and December. And there are going to be some a few tougher games ahead. I mean, the Jets still do have to go to Buffalo. I, you know, I still don't hate that matchup for the Jets, but it's not going to be easy to go go into Buffalo and come out with a win. You still have two wins, two games against the Miami Dolphins, which you know, like it's a divisional opponent. I'm not saying it's a lock; the Jets are going to get swept. Look, it, it, the Miami's kind of had like the opposite of the Jets' early schedule. Miami had a lot of easy games, and then when they had to step up in weight class against Philadelphia, you know, last weekend, didn't go quite as well. So we don't know exactly how good Miami might not be quite as good as we expect them to be. But I still think those are going to be two really tough games. You have the Black Friday game uh, day after Thanksgiving in November, and then you have a a trip to Miami in December, which I'm sure will be nice for the players going to South Florida in the month of December. You'll get out of the cold. In some ways, it's almost a treat for the Jets. But there's some relatively tougher games ahead. I think the Jets, as much as anything, once they get to the tougher part of their schedule, or at least what's remaining of the tougher part of their schedule, they want to go in playing well. They want to have some confidence. And I... You know, I hate to like say like I would need a three game winning streak and it really would be a four game winning streak. Actually, it really would be five game winning streak because the Jets are already on a two game winning streak right now. So you have three games ahead. I really want to win all three of these games, though, because I think that that's the kind of thing that can just get you on a roll. That, that's the kind of thing that builds your confidence as a football team, makes you believe that, you know, this is a team that can make some noise. You know, it, it, we're in the early stages of the NBA season. And, uh, you know, you you probably if you're an NBA fan, you know, Charles Barkley is a. a an analyst on TNT and their pregame show, their phenomenal pregame show. And one of the things he's always said is that early in the seasons, the bad teams don't realize they're bad. And it's true. And I think I'd, I'd amend that for the NFL early in the season. We, nobody really knows whether they're good or bad. And I think once you get on a roll, confidence takes over where you got, you know, that if you've got, gotten off to a really good start, you know, that you're, you're in the mix, you know, that you're, you're a team that can make some noise. And I think that that's what the next three weeks are. If the Jets get through these next three weeks, you know, three and oh, they'll be six and three. They'll be on a five game winning streak. And it will really start to feel like things are coming together for this football team. And I don't even think when you go to Buffalo or when you play Miami, you'll necessarily feel like you're overmatched. I don't think you'll necessarily, even if the other teams are favored, I'm not sure you're going to go into those games feeling like an underdog. Whereas if the Jets go two and one, well, you know, they'll still be in pretty good shape. I, I don't want to say that they won't be. There still are a lot of winnable games uh, remaining on the schedule. You don't want to go one and two over the next two uh, in the next three weeks because if you do that and you're under 500 and you're you know you're heading into the, the late part of the season under 500 you know you'll still be on the fringes of the playoff race. I don't think you'll be feeling quite as good though, and I don't think that this this is going to be looking like a team that's really going to be a factor in the AFC. So I think it's one of those simple things that if you want to be a team that's in the mix in the AFC this year, if you want to be a team that's relevant in the playoff race, go on a winning streak right now. When you have these winnable games in front of you, when you've got a team in the Giants that's you know frankly not that good, when you've got a Chargers team that's looking pretty mediocre, and even a trip to Las Vegas to play the Raiders, you know the Raiders are a team, you know the type of team that could end up in that free fall I was talking about a little bit earlier. So how did the Jets win this game? That's what we'll discuss ahead on this Friday edition of Locked On Jets. We're going to talk about some of the keys the Jets have to look for, some of the things that I think should be in their game plan. We'll discuss it all ahead here on this Friday game preview edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. This episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by FanDuel. Snap into the NFL action this season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. And if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. This weekend, the Jets are actually favored for the first time all season. Yeah, even in that week three game when they were playing a Patriots team that really hasn't been very good, New England was a road favorite, and I guess it was justified because the Patriots won, but the Jets are currently three-point favorites. I guess they're technically the road team, even though it's the game in their home stadium and we expect about a 50-50 crowd. The Jets are favored over the Giants this weekend. So if you feel confident in the Jets and you want to lay the points, head over to FanDuel. The app is easy to use and there's a wide range of betting options. So you don't just have to bet on the outcome of the Jets-Giants game. You can bet on other things. You can bet on player props, over-unders, and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. Again, it's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Thank you so much for making Locked On Jets your first listen or first watch every day. And a big shout out to you, Everydayers. This is a daily podcast covering the New York Jets. We have new episodes each day through the week, Monday through Friday. We're previewing the week eight game between the New York Jets and the New York Giants. Sunday, MetLife Stadium. Jets technically the road team in this one. It's almost a benefit because this is the one game where I feel like you want to be on the road because it's not really a road game. 
you it doesn't count against your allotment of eight to nine home games. It, it's it's technically one of your seven road games in the season, or it's technically one of your eight road games during the season. So the Jets only have seven true road games this year and 10 games in their home stadium. That's pretty good. Uh, Jets trying to get another win. They're on a two game winning streak. They're trying to win. They're also trying to win their third straight game against the Giants. They defeated the Giants back in 2015 uh, when the teams played in December, a critical game that was almost the beginning of the end for Tom Coughlin. And then 2019, a really bad game between two bad teams. That was the Adam Gase year. And Jamal Adams made a couple of big plays for the Jets in that one. Jets looking to get their third straight win, overall third straight win against the Giants. How do they do it? Well, you know, if you look at this Giants defense, I mean, it struggles in a lot of areas, but one of them is they are very bad against the run. A couple of weeks ago, the Jets were playing Denver, which was the worst run defense in the NFL. Giants are right there with Denver. Denver's are allowing five and a half yards per run. Giants are allow allowing five yards per run. So this could be a big Brees Hall game. Brees, you know, kind of bottled up by the Philadelphia Eagles two weeks ago when, as the Jets headed into their bye this is the type of game where he should take over. But I think there's also a trap he could fall into because the second half of that game against Denver, the Jets offense left a lot on the field. I think Nathaniel Hackett maybe fell into the trap a little bit after, especially after Brees Hall's 77 yard touchdown run of maybe being too predictable and leaning too much on the run game. And it's, it's a delicate balance because I still don't get the feeling the Jets coaching staff is all that confident in Zach Wilson. If you look at the way they call plays, if you look at the conservative nature of this overall offensive philosophy, but I think you have you can't fall into the trap of being predictable. And I think that's something the Jets did far too often in that Denver game because they knew they were playing a bad run defense. They knew they had Brees. And the offense just kind of stalled after that touchdown run. I mean, they were able to put together some drives, but they weren't really making big plays. And they were settling for a lot of field goals. And I think that's one of the dangers, especially when you're going up against a team that, frankly, you should beat. And I, I'm going to say this. If the Jets lose this game to the Giants, this would be a really bad loss for them. And it's the type of thing that could have residual effects going forward. This is an uh, this is a game where it's very easy to just say, well, we'll just we'll just run the ball. Well, part of the challenge that the Jets are going to have is their offensive line is going to be reshuffled once again because Joe Tippman sounds like he's not going to play. So that might make it a little bit more challenging to run the ball. Now, of course, it also makes it more challenging in pass protection. But another new offensive line alignment, their line getting reshuffled again. It's not the time to be overly predictable. Brees has got to have a big game. I think the Jets obviously are going to utilize him a lot, but I don't think you can get into this, another situation where you're doing the run, run, pass thing. Hackett's done that far too often this season. If you look at the, the times the Jets have really had success on offense, it's been when they've been unpredictable, when they've put Zach Wilson in situations where you know, he's up against a loaded box and then decides, and then they decide to throw the ball. I think one of the traps Nathaniel Hackett's, and I don't think he's done a very good job this season in a lot of areas, but I think the area where maybe he's been the worst is the predictability where the Jets, you know, it's almost like it, it's kind of ironic because I think the the nature of the conservative play calling is they, they want to keep Zach Wilson out of bad down and distances where in situations where he obviously has to throw the ball and it's going to face a heavy, a heavy pass rush. Well, the problem is that when you're that predictable, when you're running the ball, you know, in, slamming the ball into the line, even with a running back as good as Brees, and, you know, so Brees is capable of breaking the big run, but you're going to get stuffed if you lean too heavily into the run game, even against a bad defense. And when you get stuffed, that's what puts you into the bad downs and dist distances. If you want to stay out of the bad downs and distances, you got to stay ahead of the sticks. And sometimes that means being aggressive. Sometimes that means finding the right mixing and matching of, on your play calling. And I think that's the one area I worry about Hackett in this game. I also worry a little bit about the Giant if the Jets get into those bad downs and distances. Giants defensive coordinator Wink Martindale guy who likes to send blitzes from a lot of different angles, likes to be very aggressive with his defensive play calling. He's a guy who learned from Rex Ryan. So, you know, if you're a Jets fan, you know, you know what that means. You know that you're going to see a lot of different looks. They'll try and confuse the quarterback. They'll try and confuse the offensive line pre-snap. They're essentially going to try and, you know, get the team in the wrong, get the offense in the wrong protection, hopefully get a busted assignment somewhere, get a free runner at the quarterback. You want to stay out of those situations. And it's easy to say, oh, we, we, should, we just need to run the ball early. No, you got to stay ahead of the sticks. And sometimes staying ahead of the sticks means throwing the ball on early downs when they're expecting a run. And once you do that enough, then they kind of back off, and then it becomes easier, and then you have the run lanes in front of you. I think it's it, that's going to be one of the keys to the game for the Jets is finding the right balance in the run game. Now, the other thing I'll say on the defensive side of the ball, this defensive line needs to dominate. Now, fortunately, it looks like Sauce Gardner and DJ Reed are going to be back. But this is a Giants offensive line that's in a state of flux, you know, kind of like the Jets, where they've they've been dealing with a lot of injuries. They have not got very gotten very good play, especially on the interior spots. Uh, you know, Quinn and Williams. This could be like Quinn and Williams' breakout game. 
Quinnen Williams has had an excellent season so far. And I understand the stats aren't looking like it. You know, if you just do the box score scouting, you won't be that impressed by what Quinnen's doing. But if you're watching him on a play-to-play basis, you know that he's dominating. You know that he's playing great. He's playing at a very high level. Maybe he's not playing quite at the level he played at a year ago, which was a career year, but Quinnen looks great again. And this could be the kind of game where the stats finally start to move in the direction of the quality of play. And if you follow the NFL, you know that defensive tackles aren't always the guys that fill up the stat sheet because they're constantly dealing with double teams. You know, you talk, you hear about a great defensive tackles, always double teams and teams direct their blocking towards him. That's just something you have to deal with at the position. It's one of the things that kind of drives their stats down unless you have like an Aaron Donald or even a or Chris Jones, double digit sack seasons are not that common at the defensive tackle position. And, you know, in the case of Chris Jones, you know, he's not as complete of a player as Quinnen. So I, I think I think Quinnen's even a better player than Chris Jones because Quinnen is much better against the run than Jones is typically. Um, I think that, you know, this is the type of game, though, it seems like it seems like the kind of game where Quinnen actually could produce a, a big result in the stat sheet. This is the type of game that's like tailor made, I think, for him to take over against the Giants offense that in many ways has you know not been great on the offensive line in the trenches. But overall, I mean, the Giants, you know, they've been dealing with injuries at the tackle position. So even if they get their tackles back, even if they you know, are able to upgrade the tackle spot, I mean, this is a type of game where Jets' uh, defensive end should, ha- should have themselves a big game. This is, I, I look at the – even with Sauce and DJ back, and I think they'll both play really well, this is the type of game – that will tell you you'll you watch you'll, you'll watch this game and you'll see why the Jets build their defense from the defensive line back because this is the type of game where you if you win in the trenches you can shut down the other team's offense and I think it's going to be a low scoring game now as we continue on this Friday edition of Locked On Jets we're going to turn our attention away from the game because there's some other news coming out this week the trade deadline's fast approaching in the NFL and there are some Jets players who are suggesting maybe they want to be dealt before the deadline. I'll tell you who they are. We'll tell you, I'll tell you what I think about that as we continue this Friday edition of Locked On Jets. This episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform in North America. They're the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. So if you're a big Jets fan this weekend, maybe you'll have Brees Hall running for more than 80 yards. Maybe you'll have Garrett Wilson with more than one touchdown. We certainly hope so. And you should know that Prize Picks now offers Apple Pay for quick and easy deposits into your account this football season. And with the Prize Picks reboot policy, your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For NFL games and college football top 25 matchups, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with injury insurance. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL for your first deposit match of up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL. It's one word with no space, all lowercase L O C K E D O N N F L for your first deposit match of up to $100. Again, one more time, prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL, code locked on NFL. This episode is brought to you by DoorDash. Sometimes when you're watching a Jets game, you don't want to have to worry about cooking. You just want your food brought to you. That's where DoorDash comes in. DoorDash gives you access to great restaurants throughout the New York area. One great restaurant is Daily Provisions. They have breakfast all day. So if you want a bacon, egg, and cheese, you can order it. If you want avocado toast, if you want sausage, egg, and cheese, you can get it all day long. You don't just have to get it at breakfast. They also have some delicious sweets. They've got a caramel chocolate chunk cookie. They've got a blueberry lemon muffin. DoorDash helps you get access to this great restaurant and so many others throughout the area. And again, it's a chance to just relax on Sunday. You don't have to worry about cooking. You don't have to worry about going to the grocery store. Amazing food from DoorDash. And you can also go to great chain restaurants like the Cheesecake Factory, uh, get, get favorites there. It's just a great place to go to get food. And right now, you can get 50% off up to ten, a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first order. That's when you download the DoorDash app and enter code LOCKED23. Subject to change, terms apply. Again, that's 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first order when you download the DoorDash app and enter code LOCKED23. It's one word with no space, L-O-C-K-E-D, number two, number three. Subject to change, terms apply. This is the Locked On Jets podcast here on this Friday. We're now going to turn our attention to the trade deadline, which is Tuesday. There's plenty of talk about will the Jets be buyers because they are 3-3. and They're right in the middle of the playoff race. But 
They also could be sellers. They also could trade a couple of guys on their roster. They've already made one deal. They traded Mikal Hardman to Kansas City. I mean, they pretty much just decided they didn't want Hardman here anymore because they really got nothing in return for him. There are a couple other players who I'm not sure they're going to be able to get a lot of return for, but have this week kind of spoken up and said, you know, they wouldn't mind being traded. Carl Lawson is one of the veteran defensive end who's kind of been phased out with the emergence of Bryce Huff with a couple other guys stepping up. And then Dalvin Cook's also complaining. He's indicated that he may speak with his agent and Joe Douglas because he's not happy with the lack of carries he's getting. And I have two different views on these two players. I think ultimately the Jets should try and move on for both of them. I think the Cook thing is one of the things the Jets should have been cognizant of when they signed him. It was, it was always a bit of a risky signing. Like I have to admit, I liked the signing of Cook. I thought it was a good move for the Jets. So keep that in mind. Uh, I will click. I will admit I was completely wrong on that. He does not look explosive at all. You know, last year, if you looked at the reason I liked it is that he was still producing plays at a big, at a high clip. And if you looked at like the player tracking data, he still was showing signs of pretty good speed left, but it really has not worked out at all. And one of the dangers you run into when you sign the back who's used to being the star is they don't like it when their carries are reduced. And that's something Cook alluded to yesterday when he spoke to the media. He talked about how he you didn't feel like he could get into a rhythm when he wasn't getting a lot of carries. And that's something that happens a lot with star backs. And one of the problems with star running backs as they age is they're the, and this is true of star players across the league, true star players across all sports. They're always the, the star player is always the last one to realize they don't have anything left in the tank. They still think they're, they can produce at a high level. So when they stop getting the volume that they want, that's the, that's an easy excuse for them to make. We can say, well, I, I need to get more action. Well, I'm sorry, Dalvin cook. Brees Hall is the Jets' number one back. And you know something? Dalvin Cook should have known Brees Hall was the number one back. But the other thing Dalvin Cook's not used to is needing to earn his carries because in the past, Dalvin Cook's been the go-to guy out of the backfield in Minnesota. So even if he got, even if he had a couple bad games, they weren't going to go away from him because he was an established player for them. He's not established with the Jets. In fact, you get to a certain age in the NFL – it is almost a skepticism around you where you have to prove that you can still play, where you have to prove that age is not caught up with you. And I don't think Dalvin Cook realizes this. Look, we're going to be honest. This was a bad signing. The reason it was made, I think, above all else, was that Aaron Rodgers gave away, gave back a lot of money to the Jets. So he created a lot of cap space by taking a pay cut. And I think what happened was the Rodgers essentially made a condition that the Jets had to sign some big name players. But the problem was that the, it happened so late in the calendar that there really weren't many players available. Cook was one of the few options that was there for the Jets. So I think they just threw a lot of money at him. And I think part of it was, you know, they maybe they wanted some Brees Hall insurance. Part of it was probably that they thought he had a lot left in the tank because they gave him a pretty healthy contract. I don't know if anybody's going to trade for Dalvin Cook at this point. I mean, even if you're, even if you're a team with, a bad running back situation. I don't know why you'd want to take Dalvin Cook on. I'm sure the Jets are going to have to eat some, eat a lot of the salary if they're going to be able to deal him. I don't think anybody's going to take Dalvin Cook at his at his current salary. I think the Jets may have to end up eating most of the salary and take a, you know, perhaps a late round pick swap or something like that. If they get anything for him, you know, I, I think you'd take it. I, I just don't think he's he's an asset. I don't think him taking up a roster spot is even worth it for the Jets at this point. I think the same could be said of Carl Lawson. For me, the way the Jets have handled the Lawson thing is really inexplicable. Like Dalvin Cook, I can understand from the standpoint is they made a bad evaluation and they felt pressure because Rodgers gave back the money and they whiffed on, they whiffed thinking Dalvin Cook is, should, should still play. Bad job, but I can understand it. With Lawson, I really don't get what they were doing because they could have cut him this offseason and saved over $10 million of cap space. Instead, they kept him around and they pushed a lot of dead money to the future. And he didn't even have a role with. He doesn't really, even really have a role with the team. He's he barely plays. Lawson's also indicated that he wants to play more. You know, he's he, he kind of said that he's not against being traded right now if it leads to more playing time. My only question is why the Jets kept him if he wasn't going to play. I mean, they, again, they could have saved a lot of money by by cutting him this offseason or trading him this offseason. Maybe somebody will take a chance on him. I, I could see somebody taking a chance on Lawson. Everybody needs pass rushers in the NFL. I think part of the question is can he pass a physical? Because there were all these rumblings in the in the preseason about him having a back injury, and I mean, I don't know if, if it's just age. I don't know if he's not into. I'm not, I don't know. Maybe he's not focused because he's not playing a lot, or maybe he's just hurt. I mean, the back backs can be tough, especially for defensive ends. So I don't know what's going on with Lawson. I think the Jets probably could trade him. I think they probably should just get what they can for him at this point if he's not going to be happy. Because I think you also want to avoid unhappy guys in the locker room as you as the season turns to November and December. Um, you know. It's just a situation where Lawson 
it doesn't really have much of a role for the team at this point. Cook should not have any role for the team at this point. And I think trading both of these guys could make some sense. I don't know if the Jets will be able to get anything of value. In an ideal world, maybe you'd be able to do a player for player swap and get something, you know, something that could help you out. Maybe a, maybe a player whose role has been diminished to the position of need for the Jets from another team. But those trades tend to be easier said than done. Anyway, that's all for today's episode. This has been the Lockdown Jets podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Your team every day is our motto. As always, if you enjoy the show, hit the subscribe button where you're watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. If you enjoy the show and are listening on a podcast source, give it a five-star review. If you are watching on YouTube and enjoy the show, give this episode a big thumbs up. These things help us out, help other Jets fans find the podcast. Have a great weekend, everybody. Enjoy the game. We'll be back on Monday.